Happy Sabbath. I don't know if you had one of those weeks. One of those weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in New York. We were dedicating my niece, this baby. And with the family, it was awesome to be back in New York City. And then last weekend, we were at the men's retreat. It was an awesome time. Um, the men got together uh, sharing sermon illustrations about parrots and bulls that uh, I can never repeat here, okay? <laughs> but something that happened that weekend was on Saturday, they called all the pastors to the front and they had a special prayer for all the pastors. And I went along with it, and okay. But then Chris Montello, your men's ministry director, had a special meeting with the, with the men of Miami Temple. And he got, gathered us and he reminded us that it's time for men uh, not to be passive. He said, it's time for us to take a stand. When are we going to take a stand? When, when, when our marriages are falling apart, when our kids are leaving the church. So he challenged us men to be active. And then he said, even though I know that they just finished praying for the pastors, I want the men of Miami Temple to pray for their pastors. So we had Pastor Marsh and Pastor Thompson and myself, and they prayed. And one thing that Chris said, he reminded the men, he says, we need to pray for our pastors. Because as men, we are being attacked. But as pastors, they are being attacked even more. Because if they go down, the rest of us is a piece of cake. And so he prayed. And that was Saturday. A high Sabbath. And it reminded me 2,000 years ago on another high Sabbath where Jesus was at a party. You may want to lower this because I'm going to get excited today. And so he was at a party where Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus as the Messiah. And it was there that he was anointed. And then from there, the next day on Sunday, on Sunday, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And everyone was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. And it was a high Sunday. Like last Sunday, we were leaving the retreat. We left early. And Pastor Marsh was excited. Pastor Marsh, I always like picking on him when he's not here. Pastor Marsh was excited because last Sunday he was celebrating his three-month anniversary. <laughs> so he was like, Pastor, can we get home? Because, you know, I, I miss my wife. I said, yeah, I got you, Bob. I got you. Let's go. And so we were driving. We were laughing. And we dropped him off at Lauder Hill. And we're in Lauder Hill. And I'm like, hey, Morris. Morris was with me you hungry? Because I know they got some Jamaican patties here. And so we went looking for Jamaican patties. But it was Sunday. And the places were closed. Come on. Who, who will close the Jamaican place on a Sunday? But thank you, Jesus. There was some pagan that was open. on. <laughs> so we had some Jamaican patties. And Morris and I just drove back home. And so... Linda, when I get home, Linda is sitting in the sofa, and she says, babe, uh, look at my feet. And I'm like, okay, I just drove seven hours. Do you want me to look at your feet? She goes, I, I, I've, I have a tingling sensation. Tell me, you know. And when I looked at them, they were orange. And I babe, they're orange. And, and she goes, yeah, I thought I had at least feet. And so I put that... Uh, What's that, the cream for the Atlas feet? So it kind of stained her feet, and, uh, Atlas, Atlas foot. And so she went to bed, like, ah, there's nothing. You know, you're, you're, getting, you're getting older. Thank God she's not here. Um, so anyway, so on Monday she woke up, and the tingling feeling went up to her legs, to her knees. And so she went to work, we came back. They, she said, babe, let's go to urgent care. So we went to urgent care. We stayed there. And the doctor said, you need to go to, see, you need to see a neurologist. So Linda made the appointment for Wednesday. But then she went to work on Tuesday. And now she's not feeling well. The, the, her walk is a little different. And so her coworkers said, you need to go to the emergency room. 
And so we took her to the emergency room. And there she was on a battery of tests. And it reminded me of how quickly we went from this celebration, like Jesus, he was celebrating, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it became somber. And so, the question I have for you today is why are you a Christian? The world celebrates right now this, this Passion Week and, and tomorrow's Easter Sunday. But for us Adventists, we know that Jesus died on Good Friday and he's resting in the tomb on Saturday. But tomorrow, Sunday, he rose from the dead. And so the question I have for you is why, why are you a Christian? Because it's easy to be a Christian when everything is going well. It's, it's easy when we come to church and we had an awesome song service and that song duet, man, it just takes you to heaven. It's easy when all of that is there. But it's a different story when Friday comes. The Bible says that Jesus, Jesus didn't die so that we could have a religion. He died so that we could have a relationship with him. And for as Adventists, you know, for growing up, um, um, something that I appreciate in California, in California, uh, I never saw this in an Adventist church because we usually do everything on Saturday, right? But in this, at, in, in PUC, we would meet on Sunday morning and we would have an early rise Sunday morning to commemorate what Jesus did that day. As Adventists, we, we don't do that. I don't know why. We think that the ultimate is the cross. And yes, the ultimate is the cross. But if Jesus did not come out of the grave, then there was, it, it means nothing. Because there's many people that have died for good causes and bad causes. But Jesus is the only one that was able to say, I will die for your sins and I will raise from the dead after three days. And so, history says, the ultimate proof of Christianity rests not on wishful thinking, but on a historical, physical event. This is why we are Christians, because of what Christ did on that Sunday morning. If you have your Bibles with me, well, maybe not, maybe your apps today. We turned off the light to kind of create this, this mood. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because there was a problem happening in the early church where they were not believing in the resurrection. And they were not believing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. They actually said that he was a spirit. And so Paul wrote this letter to kind of smack up the church to say, hey, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast on the word that I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 2 says, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the what? And in the, when Paul was around, the scripture was the Old Testament. Did he have the New Testament? It was being written at that time. And the, the verse that Paul was referring to is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, where it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are what? We need to remember that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what? will not perish. We were damned because of the decisions that Adam and Eve made, but also the decisions that we make daily. And so Paul was reminding us of that gospel, that we're not saved by works, we're saved by what Christ did, amen? amen? And so he says, he says, he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the what? It's sad that there was, there was a time in this country where all you had to say was, it is written. There was a time in this country where you could just say, the Bible says, and that was it, end of story. But the devil now has created a new attack inside the church and even outside the church where now we're questioning the reliability of the Bible. Questions like, well, we weren't there. and Well, what if someone manipulated the scriptures? You know, how do we know? The devil has is doing the same thing 
that he did in the beginning. God said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you, Adam, shall eat freely of every tree of the garden except one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so the devil came as a serpent and he looked at Eve and he said, didn't God say that you couldn't eat of all the trees? And then he twisted the word of God and that's how we were deceived. And the devil is doing the same thing again because he's saying there's no way that Jesus rose from the dead. And one thing he used, the contradictions of the Bible. You know that there are contradictions in the Bible, right? Please do not be naive and, and think that there's no contradictions in the Bible. I know you're like, oh, pastor, where are you going today? Well, let, let me help you. I would challenge you to take note because someone is going to throw these verses at you. And hopefully my job is to teach you how to refute what they're going to tell you. So Matthew 28, Matthew 28 says that early Sunday morning that Mary went to the tomb. Mary went to the tomb and the stone was covering the tomb. And that there was an earthquake and that an angel moved the stone. That's Matthew 28. But Mark 16 records that three women came to the, to the tomb and that the stone had been moved. That's Mark 16. Matthew 28 records that there was an angel sitting on top of the stone. M Mark chapter 16 says no. There was a young boy that was sitting inside the tomb and spoke to the women. Luke chapter 24 says no. There were two men that were sitting in the tomb. And so the Bible continues that Matthew 28 says, no, it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene that went to see Jesus. Mark 16 says, no, it was Mary, Mary Magdalene, and a woman named Salome. I got you confused yet? It gets more interesting. It says in Luke chapter 24 that, no, 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 no. It was Mary Magdalene, Mary, and this woman named Joan. Have you ever heard of Joan in the Bible? <laughs> That's the first time she's mentioned. A woman named Joan, and the Bible says that other women were present. Matthew says that Jesus, uh, when Mary left the tomb, that she met Jesus on the way. But Mark says, no, when they saw that the tomb was empty, they ran out of there and they didn't say a word. Luke chapter 16 says, no. Luke 16 says that the women went and told the disciples, he is alive. So what are you going to do with that, church? Because people will say, you see? You see the contradictions? How can you believe in something where it has so many different versions? Well, let me remind you. Philosophers think that way. Philosophers will say if something is inconsistent, then the law of contradiction says this can't be true, so throw it out. That's what philosophers says. But historians take a different approach. It says, I see some inconsistency, but I notice something about them. They're all in the secondary details. Let me help you. You've been to a wedding. And when you've been to a wedding, you're going to have different perspective. You're going to have the bride and groom's perspective. You're going to have the bride maids and bride's groom's perspectives. You're going to have the pastor's perspective. And then you're going to have the guest's perspective. And each of you are going to be looking at different things. But there's one thing that we can all agree. There was a wedding. The same thing if we observe or witness a car accident. We witness a car accident. Many women that are here that are mothers will notice, Ivan Dito, there's a baby in the car. For us men, be like, man, that was a nice Mustang that just got messed up. <laughs> right? We're going to look at different things. But we all can agree on one thing. There was an accident. And so it's the same thing with the Bible. Here's the story that's consistent. Joseph pulled down Jesus from the cross. Joseph of Arimathea laid him in his tomb. That yes, there was women that came to the tomb and they found it empty and, and they saw visions. They saw angels. They saw an angel. They saw something that said, he's not dead. He's alive. That's what's consistent in the story. So what do we do? Do we just throw the baby with the bath water and say, you know, well, well, Let's be educated. This is what a historian says in the book, The Case for Christ. A historian says, 
So we can have great confidence in the core that's common to the narrative and that would be agreed upon by the majority of New Testament scholars today. Even if there are some differences, those kind of secondary discrepancies wouldn't bother a historian. Secular historian says this, True, the discovery of the empty tomb is differently described by the various Gospels, but if we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources. Everyone has a problem with Jesus. Did you know that the Gospels were written 50 years after Jesus died? Okay? So many of the people were, that were witnesses were alive. But we don't have a problem with Alexander the Great. We don't have a problem if, if, if arguing that our, uh, Alexander the Great lived on this earth, even though his biography was written 300 years after he died. No one argues that. But we have a problem with Jesus. You see how the devil just likes to just take the glory away from God. Here this is what a secular historian says. Uh, we, we apply it to any other ancient literary sources. Then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed what? Empty. But here's just a thought. Here's just a thought. I'm watching, I'm reliving the OJ trial because of the movie in FX. Uh, anyway. It says, if all four Gospels were identical in all their minutia, that would have raised the suspicion of what? Plagiarism. That's why when they're witnesses, if the witness is telling the same story, ah, oh, they collaborated. So that's why you have to look at the whole picture, the main picture. And so here's the point. Here's the point. Here's another point. If they wanted to make up the Bible, they would not use women as the main protagonist. Because my, my apologies to the women of today. In the days of Jesus, the women had no worth. Your, your testimony meant nothing in a court of law. They would not call you. And so here is the gospel writers are using women to say he's alive. If it was an invention of man, they would have put Peter, James, and John, like we men, you know, we love the, the attention. They would have put themselves as the star of the movie. But that's not what happened. There are people that would say, well, no. You've got to be careful what you watch in the History Channel and all these TV shows. That's not Bible, hello. That's just like Google, you know. I'm going to talk about Google in a minute. People say that the disciples stole the body of Christ. Really? This is the same Peter that it took a little girl to say, oh, I know you. I see you with him. I never saw him. I don't know what the, uh, I've never seen him. A little girl threw him off. It was the same disciples that abandoned Jesus. And you're going to tell me that all of a sudden, they became the Mission Impossible team? Dun, 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 right? And, and they, 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 they snuck around the Roman guards and they went into the tomb that was sealed by Rome and they stole the body? But I'll give you another one. This is the list of all the disciples and how they died. Andrew was crucified, beaten, then crucified. James was beheaded. Judas, not Iscariot, was stoned to death. Matthew was speared to death. Peter was crucified upside down. Simon was crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Matthias was stoned to death. It's one thing for you to die for the truth, but would you die for a lie? I don't think so. I don't think so. The other thing that they will say is that, no, that the Romans and the Jews worked together, and they got rid of the body. Really? Wow. Then when Christianity was growing, all they had to do was produce the body of Christ. And that would have destroyed the momentum of Christianity. They did not have to throw Christians in the, in, in the arenas to be eaten by lions if it was a fabrication by the Jews and the Romans. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Because there are people that will even say this one. This is the one that gets me. The swoon theory has been around since the 16th century. And these college kids now, they're like, oh, pastor, did you know about the swoon theory? I'm like, yeah, it's been around for a long time. That says that Jesus was not really dead when they put him in the tomb. That he was unconscious and that the cold tomb woke him up. And then he walked out. Church, the reason why I'm saying this, why are you a Christian? Because there will be, there will be people out there that will dismantle 
your belief system. So here we are. We went to the doc, to hospital, and Linda's getting all types of tests. And yes, we went into Dr. Google. Don't go to Dr. Google if you're sick. The, the symptoms that, that Google gave us was from pancreatic cancer, Lyme disease, uh, uh, deficiency of B12, and then, of course, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. And so now we're playing this waiting game. What are we doing? What are we doing? We're waiting. And on Thursday, on Thursday, as I was, I was leaving to pick up the kids, um, I stand on top, on, 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 by her bedside. And I look at her and I said to her, I wish it was me and not you. And it's funny how life, life works, right? You forget certain things. I met Linda, I know Linda since I was seven years old. And we grew up together in the church and she dated other people and, and I dated other people. But what brought us together, believe it or not, you're not going to believe it, and, and, and I will deny it if you say anything. I will say I never said that. But what brought us together was an organ because she was the organist of our church. She doesn't want you to know that she plays the organ or she used to play the organ. She doesn't play the organ. She doesn't play the organ, okay? And so me being that, that crazy teenager, she would practice Sabbath afternoon. And so I was like Mr. Smooth Operator. I would say, hey, Linda, do you need help with turning the pages? And so I would sit next to her just turning the pages. And I remember that as I'm standing in, in, on top of the bed and, 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 and I'm remembering my niece that passed away, my, my other niece, that my cousin that had uh, this other disease. That, and I'm like, Lord, let's do a switch. My kids need their mother. If I go, Morris, Miami Temple will continue. And, 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 but my kids need my wife. My wife looks at me and says, what if everything that we have gone through was in preparation for this and what's about to happen? And she reminded me that this is not the end. We all know that Jesus is coming soon. Let me remind us Adventists that before Jesus comes, there is the time of Jacob, the trial of Jacob that we all have to go through. And so she looks at me, she holds my hand, and she says, listen, maybe God is preparing us for this or for something worse. That was Thursday. Let me ask you, why are you a Christian? Because if you're a Christian, just, and I'm talking to those of you who are just here on Easter and Christmas, please forgive me. But, but if you're just here to kind of, hey, Lord, I'm here, and then stack my ticket, I made it today to church, then you have it all wrong. Because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with God. Amen. That when the devil comes after us, we have something to stand. Amen. And my wife there on Thursday, she was standing on the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that was Thursday. And Friday was coming. And so here's Paul going back to Paul. He says, listen, guys, listen to church. Jesus appeared to Cephas. You know who Cephas was, right? Peter. He appeared to Peter and to the twelve, and he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul is saying, listen, the, these men are still here that saw Jesus. I'm not making this up. But then in, 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 the, in the verse that follows, in verse 15, verse 12, I'm sorry, he says, if Christ had not been raised. So now he says, okay, I'll, 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 I'll entertain this thought. Let's pretend for a minute that Jesus did not raise from the dead. Did not happen. So he says, your preaching is useless and so is your faith. And so I'm talking to Miami Temple Church. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, then we, I, am wasting my time here preaching to you. Yeah. We should be right here right now at South Beach, man, just partying it up. Because Jesus did not raise from the dead.
But he goes on and says, he goes on and says, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is what? Futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have what? So if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then our dear departed ones that were here with us and are longer with us, we will never see them again. We will never see uh, Katie and, and, and De Deborah. We will never see Wilney's mom. We will never see the Andersons again. We will not see Brother John. We will not see my dear Piglet. So Paul says in verse 32, Paul says, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But Jesus says, he goes on to say, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. So Friday, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was betrayed. He was handed to the, the Roman authority, the Sanhedrin. They beat him. They beat him senseless. The Jews beat him. The Romans beat him. And then they put him in front of the people. And, and, and Pilate says, look, make a choice. Jesus... Barabbas. And he was hoping that they would choose Jesus. But they chose Barabbas. And here is the, the picture. Everyone here, we are Barabbas. We deserve to die. And Jesus took our place. And then they, they took him and they placed a crown of thorns and they, they hung him on a cross and he was there. And he cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? And he cried out, but my God, my God, please forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So yesterday, the doctors came. And he said to us, the diagnoses are, are here, the test results are in, you have multiple sclerosis. My wife held it strong. And when the doctor left, he just falls on my arms and just cries. The woman who I've spent most of my life with, the mother of my children, now we have the unknown. What's going to happen? Just like the disciples, as they saw Jesus on the tomb, they probably thought, what's going to happen now? We followed him for three and a half years. And we gave our lives, we left everything to follow this man, and, and, and now it's over. But that was Friday. The Bible says, but now, Paul says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. Now Christ is risen from the dead. Now Christ is risen from the dead. The devil tried to hold Jesus back. The devil tried by putting a whole legion of Roman soldiers outside the tomb. The devil tried to keep Jesus out of the tomb. But when the father said, Jesus, come out, Jesus said, yes, sir. And he came out. And because he came out of the grave, the Bible says he has become the first fruit of them that slept. He is the first fruit, meaning that in Israel, when you gave the first fruit, that was an offering that you gave that signified that now when you just gave to God, God is going to bless everything else. And so just because he raised from the dead, now we have the assurance that we will see our loved ones again. Amen. Because the Bible says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, they shall be brought to pass the same as written. Death is swallowed up in victory. And that's why this hymn was ringing in my ears last night. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And so Paul is saying, listen guys, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is 
thy victory. My wife cleared, cleared, cleared her face. And she looked at me and she says, All right, Bob, this is just a bump in the road. The devil know, doesn't know who he's messing with. She wasn't referring to God, she was referring to herself. <laughs> devil doesn't know who he's messing with and the God that I serve. Because this is not the end. This is a journey that's going to glorify God. And it's amazing how um, God works because, because Jesus rose from the dead. We will see the Petersons. We will see the, the but Willie's Bob. We will see the Andersons. We will see John. We will see my little piglet. But here's the other thing I want to remind us. That because Jesus raised from the dead, he, he ascended from the tomb. What's next? He's coming back. Amen. He's coming back. And that is what Easter Sunday is all about. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Paul says, Paul says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. I wasn't supposed to be preaching this Sabbath. Paul Graham was supposed to be the preacher. He was supposed to have spring evangelism. But he couldn't make it, so we had to do some switches. And so I'm like, okay, what am I going to preach on? The Lord put 1 Corinthians 15 in my heart. But now 1 Corinthians 15 makes sense to me. Because Paul is talking to me. Lafitte, therefore, stand firm. Let nothing move you, Linda. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. And this is what I want to remind us. Always give in to the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord is not just for us to come and sit in church. The work of the Lord is to be multiplied of the hope. To let the world know, yes, Jesus came. Jesus rose and he's coming back. And he's saying, I need you to stand firm to the work of the Lord. If there's anything I learned this sweet church, being in a hospital for the whole week, I saw many people that are dying, many people that are hurting. Linda was not discouraged or despaired because she knows that her Redeemer lives. But there's so many others that don't have that hope. And so we come here every Sabbath, we come here and hear the same message. And God is saying we need to be multiplied of his hope because he's coming. And he says, stand firm, always give yourself fully, not halfway, not just on Easter, not just on Christmas, all the way fully. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's amazing how Facebook preaches to us. They have a feature called Memories. And every morning I get this, you know, hey, you want to, we appreciate your memories and we want you to enjoy your memories of the past. This Wednesday, this was the memory that Facebook reminded me of. I posted this at PUC four years ago. And I told the students, you never know how big of a threat you are to the enemy until you start doing something for God. Amen. And so as I read that, and then what happened on Saturday with the prayers, where Chris Montello, his words echoing, that saying, listen, we need to pray because the devil is coming after you. The devil is coming to destroy this. And if anything, this encourages us not to be a warrior, but to be a warrior. Why? Because we're on the right track, my temple. The devil's a coward, and he's a defeated foe. Bring it on, because this is not over. Amen. See, there's a story that I love. It's about, uh, it must be true, I got it on the internet. Um, <laughs> it, it's a story of when, when a Jew goes to eat in a restaurant, and after he's finished, if, if the food was good, he takes a napkin and he throws it on the plate. But if he really loved the food, he folds it and he places it on top of the plate, which lets the master know, this was good and I will be back. 
Jesus folding his clothes on the tomb. He was letting us know, I will be back. Amen. Death has no victory. He will be back. And I know that with Linda, she will stand here Amen. and she will preach. Amen. And you will hear a sermon like you never heard before. Amen. On the way out today, you're going to receive uh, an Easter egg. And by the way, you know, I, I don't discourage creativity and ideas. You have a team here, Pam and Blair and the team that put together this phone. Because that video that you just saw, imagine if that was true today. Imagine if Jesus resurrected today. What would you write? What would you text on your phone? For us today, living in 2016, is just another story. But for those people, they were excited. Amen. Our God is not dead. Amen. Our Christianity is not based on this theory or fable. It is God himself who came down. And so I know that Easter eggs are pagan, but each of you are going to receive an Easter egg, and hopefully, I'm gonna give you a story that you're gonna share with someone. There's a teacher, a Sabbath school teacher, who, who gave each of her students an empty Easter egg. And she tells the students, I want you to go home and fill it with something that represents life. And so the students went and came back, and she told the students, put all the eggs on the table. And so she did. And as she opened each egg, one, as she opened one, there was a butterfly. But it was dead. And so she quickly covers it. But Mary says, uh, teacher, that's mine. And, and, and she goes, yeah, but, but it's dead. No, teacher, the butterfly represents life, the end of winter the beginning of spring. Oh, that's good. She opens up another Easter egg and, and there, was a, there was a rock and she quickly closed it and she didn't want to embarrass the student. And, and, and little George said, that's mine. And he goes, but it's a rock. What does it represent? She goes, teacher, look, it's a rock. But underneath, there's moss and that represents life. And so she did, the students went and, and they were sharing and there were jelly beans and whatnot. And she opened up the last one and it was empty. So she quickly closed it because she knew who gave her this egg. It was David. David suffered from a, a mental disorder and, and she didn't want to embarrass him. And so she quickly puts the egg away. But, but George was like, Hey, that's, that's my egg. And, and she goes, yeah, I, I, I know, but we're going to start class. No, you open everyone else's eggs. Can you open my egg? And the teacher goes, okay, okay. So she opens it, and all the students start laughing. Ah, ha, ha, George, you didn't put anything in the egg. Ah, ha, ha. And so she quickly dismisses everyone. Shh. And George says, no, teacher, can I see why it's empty? Please, why did you give us an empty egg? Because the tomb is empty. Jesus is living, and he is life. The story goes that at the end of the school year, George passed away, and on that funeral, all the students brought their Easter eggs, opened it, and they put it on the casket. Why am I telling you the story? Because you will receive an Easter egg. And I want you to go. There's jelly beans and there's a memory verse. But I want you to find someone to give this to them and explain the story to them. Because if there's anything about the multiplication of hope, what is hope? And I love what, what Alexis put on the bulletin. Hope is to want or expect something that will happen in the future. Right now, what I want more than anything is for my wife to be well. Amen. That's what I'm hoping for with all my, pop, my, my, my energy and my strength. I want her to be well. That is what I'm hoping for. I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not going to wish it. I am going to chase after that. I'm going to do everything in my power to help her overcome this disease. Now imagine 
if we can have the same zeal and let the world know God's not dead. Amen. He's coming back. Amen. And so, I didn't get a chance to do it in the first service. Is there someone here as the team comes up to sing? Is there someone here today that wants to say, today I give my heart to Jesus. On this Easter Sabbath, I want to surrender all to Jesus.